Welcome everyone to the Coin Review Podcast number 22. Today is November 9th, 2014, and the Bitcoin price is hovering around $345. About a 6% rise in the past week, actually. And coincidentally, the rise actually happened around the same time that uh, the death happened of various darknet markets at the hands of the federal government and allied um, allied law enforcement agencies around the world. So basically, this came out of nowhere. Um, they dubbed it Operation Anonymous with a Y <laughs> instead of an I. There's a play on the words anonymous and ominous. Um, so they go after all these anonymous darknet marketplaces online where you can buy drugs for Bitcoin. Um, Silk Road 2.0, dead, gone, rest in peace. Uh, literally, this happened a year after it was created. So the original Silk Road went down. Ross Ulbricht was arrested in early October of 2013. And then literally one month after that, Silk Road 2.0 was, was put up and started doing business. And then um, the price spiked to 1000 bucks. So let's hope that happens again. Yeah. If, that, if that happens, I'm cashing out. <laughs> a lot, I think a lot of people will. I bet a lot of people actually will cash out on the way up there as well. I won't cash out everything. I'll just get like, you know, a good thousand out of it at least. Uh-huh, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, let's let's talk about the price a little bit for a second. Like, you know, some people are thinking this is going to maybe lead to the next bubble coming up like this winter. Um, uh, like... But, you know, there's a lot of people who are just waiting to get a positive investment on their on their money. And, like, yeah. we're at 345 right now. Um, once we hit 400, there's probably going to some, be some people who bought in the 300s who want to cash out and realize their earnings. Yeah, there's going to be people who are selling all the way up to, you know, 1,200 because there's still people who bought in at 1,200 who are now yeah. sitting on Bitcoins at 345. Yeah. I mean, all all of this year, there's people who've been buying at uh, 900, 800, 700, 600, all the way down. Um, like even in the spring, in the spring we had a we had a short run up uh, from like the 400 range to the 600 range, and um, apparently that was enough for a lot of people to cash out then as well, and then the price went down again. So, um, like. Hey, we'll, we'll see if it leads to, on the, to another bubble, but, like, um, it's it's pretty interesting to, to see the federal governments and all these law enforcement agencies try and take down what they see as the illegitimate aspects of digital currency and, you know, uh, these internet marketplaces. So, like, I'll mention some of the other marketplaces that got taken down. Um, not only Silk Road 2.0, but... Also, Hydra, uh, Cloud9, um, the Cannabis Road forums were taken down, um, uh, Tor Bazaar, uh, and there's there's a there's a few others as well. Like the FBI actually claimed that they took down 400 total darknet market or darknet websites. There's that many. Hey, apparently this. Apparently, that the darkness huge, uh, but like that number has actually been um, estimated downward since that figure was released because apparently, like a lot of those hundreds are like mirrors of duplicate websites oh, yeah. or just like forums, forums related to to something. So they yeah, took those down. I only knew actually, of like, like fifteen or twenty. Yeah, yeah, like. The number's actually been taken down to, like, 27 now. I saw one article that provided a more accurate number of 27 darknet, like, individual websites were taken down. And, you know, actually, like, two of the major ones, Agora and Evolution, uh, which are, like, actually, those were two, those were in the top five darknet market websites before this week. And they're still up. 
Um, Agora is easily now the largest market, and Evolution is obviously number two now based on the absence of the others. And they're still up and running. The um, people, you know, people who aren't spooked <laughs> too much by this whole takedown are still using them. Um, I think an administrator from Agora uh, came out and said that everything's fine, that they are, are doing fine. Vendors have come out and said that they're still in business. They haven't been, um, you know, arrested or taken in. Uh, they are um, using full encryption across everything. Like, user info is totally secure. So they're trying to reassure their customers that they aren't going to, like, make the same mistakes that led to the downfall of Silk Road 2.0. So I think the real story here is the fact that Silk Road 3.0 launched just a few hours after 2.0 was taken down. Because um, that's basically just a big F you to the FBI and uh, basically telling them that they're never ever going to win because there's no way they can kill the entire dark net market economy, because mm -hmm. um, I guarantee you, like, within a month, there will be, you know, twice as many markets as there were, you know, a couple yeah. days ago before the bust. Yeah. Like, people, I, just, I mean, surely a lot of people see opportunity now. There's a whole vacuum of, of business now that people want to get in on and fill that vacuum that is, is left there now by these by these takedowns. I also like how um, people keep creating markets and, re and uh, renaming them Silk Road because um, I think that's just a really big slap in the face to, to the FBI because, you know, you take down Silk Road, well, haha, joke's on you, here's uh, 2.0. Um, haha, joke's on you again, here's 3.0. Yeah. Um, I just want to see the day when there's it's like Silk Road... 3,000 or whatever, and the FBI is just still trying so hard, and they're just failing, wasting all their money. Yeah, there was actually, there was a satire article that someone wrote and was posted on the Bitcoin subreddit, um, a satire article, like, from, oh, yeah, I saw from, from like 300 years in the future, <laughs> right? Silk Road 317 point, the United Earth Forces. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then it was, and then it said, um, Online drug trade is done for good. Yeah, yeah. Like they it's say, like, every yeah, we'll stop these dangerous, um, these sucrose traders who are, you know, consuming this dangerous substance called sucrose, which gives you a short burst of energy and then gives you le lethargy, you know, hours hours down the line. We will not let any unhealthy substance be in the hands of our citizens. <laughs> Like, okay, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty clever article. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, this whole thing started out basically with file sharing with Napster. Um, and we've seen kind of like, kind of like the file transferring business model, or file sharing business model, like, transfer over to the drug market because, um, you know, like, Jeffrey Tucker always talks about this, and I'm a huge Jeffrey Tucker fan. He he always jokes about how um, when the government took down Napster, they, they said, well, that's that's the end of file sharing. We don't have to worry about piracy anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have, you know, BitTorrent, Pirate Bay, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing is happening. can't stop it. Yeah, yeah, the same thing is happening with, with drugs now. So, you know... At some point in the mid 2000s, um, they basically just gave up. Like they kind of, they kind of stopped going after people who were uh, torrenting music and movies and things like that because it was just impossible to stop all of them because um, everyone does it. And there's just um, prisons aren't big enough for you know the entire world's population. So the same I like. I kind of wonder when the same thing is going to start happening with the uh, drug markets. Like, how how many times are they going to have to uh, bust these markets and shut them down and seize their assets? How many times um, are how many times will we have to have two markets replace every one that gets taken down before they're just like, 
yeah, this really just isn't going to work. And we're just, we're just going to have to stop but, enforcing it because we're just wasting money. But it is working for them, though. It's working for them in multiple ways because, number one, they get to have this huge PR campaign, basically, where they're like, we took down these dangerous, you know, black markets with dangerous drugs and weapons and fraud is, is, is happening in, in all this. And, like, they get a pat on the back from their superiors. They get a pat on the back from President Obama and all the people in the, in the government and also regular citizens who look at this and be like, oh, well, that's pretty dangerous. I'm glad law enforcement has taken that down. So, like, they get this huge whole thing. And then not to mention the actual profit that they make from stealing the money associated with these black net, black markets. Um, you know, uh, they, you know, took millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin from Silk Road 2.0. Um, it wasn't, I don't think it was quite as much as they took from the first Silk Road, uh, but still, you know, millions. And then they also went after individual vendors who were selling bit, um, selling drugs through these markets. They went after a couple of guys in Ireland um, and seized, you know, <laughs> tons and tons of, of drugs, as well as uh, $2.5 million worth of Bitcoin, which seems like a really absurd number for just one particular vendor to have of Bitcoin on hand. But that's what the, that's what the Irish um, news story said. So, like, they're making bank off this, and they're just going to auction that off again down the road like they did with the, with the other Silk Road Bitcoins and make a ton of money for the government. So, but, like, it doesn't even really matter if they take down the entire, like, uh, you know, the entire black economy or not because they're making profit. They're getting paid to do this. Their jobs are secure. They're... They're getting um, job security um, from from doing this stuff, and it's it's relatively easy for them because it's you know the Silk Road guy Blake Benthal who was allegedly running Silk Road 2.0. It was so easy to catch him because he literally used his own personal email address to sign up for the for the <laughs> server to to host Silk Road 2.0. His email address was blake at benthal.net. <laughs> well, that's just stupidity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's just, yeah. Uh, he, that guy is just really stupid. So, Epically my, stupid. My theory is that, um, is that the more they crack down on these markets, the smarter the operators are going to get, the more decentralized they're going to become. Um, we already saw that busting the first Silk Road um, essentially gave rise to Open Bazaar, which um, cannot be, you know, taken down ever, um, because there is no central point of failure. So, um, at some point, they will have to stop because it will become impossible for them to stop these people, um, and. Yeah, you said they're, it was extremely profitable. They're getting, you know, their superiors are patting them on the back and all these things. But that's only going to go on for so long because um, people actually think that they're, you know, making progress. Um, mm. You know, when they when they bust the millionth um, market, dark net market, uh, you know, people are going to start being like, Wow, you know they've been doing this for like 20 years now, and it hasn't, you know, stopped anything. Uh, like, is this yeah. really an effective use of my tax money? Um, kind of the same you know, way people are starting to question the whole war on drugs now, 20, yeah, 30 years and, later. Yeah, that's also another factor to take in consideration too. People are becoming more tolerant of drug users. Right now, that's kind of isolated to marijuana, but you know, slowly but surely, that's going to expand to all drugs. Um, yeah. You know, the, yeah. Some point in the distant future. So, I mean, it's not it's not going to last forever. At some point, they're going to have to give it up. And um, you know, they're not really limiting anyone's access to drugs because um, you know it's the same it's the same thing when they do traditional busts with drug with drug dealers like in the physical world. You know, for every one for every one street dealer they arrest, there's three more that take his place because they just want to make the money because there's just so much money to be made in it. Um, yeah. So it'll never stop. 
they'll never stop. They'll never be successful. Uh, at some point, they're just gonna have to give up because it's gonna bankrupt them. You know, we spend we spend what is it like fifty billion dollars a year on on the drug war, um, and it hasn't done anything. Um, you know, marijuana is actually positive. Mar- marijuana has actually gotten better since uh, we started this ridiculous drug war and and. When was it, like the 70s or 80s? Yeah. Um, states are actually starting to legalize it. Uh, D.C. actually voted to legalize marijuana, I'm pretty sure, for recreational uses and the yeah. recent midterm election. Um, yeah. It's pretty – it's coincidental. It's pretty funny that, that, you know, they take down these drug markets a day after the midterm election where Washington, D.C. legalized recreational <laughs> marijuana. Alaska legalized marijuana, and Oregon legalized marijuana. Yeah, recreational. So, you know that we're just our society, the world in general, is just becoming so much more tolerant of marijuana, and hopefully, it'll um, at some point in the future will be more tolerant of all drugs in general. Um, so you know they just can't they can't keep this up forever, and if they try to, they'll just become even more unpopular than they already are, and that. We won't do anything but harm them because people will, you know, give them less legitimacy. So mm-hmm. I don't. Um, I'm going to play into the the Bitcoin cliche uh, and say that this is actually good news because it's just proof that you know the FBI can't do anything, um, anything significant in in this area of the Bitcoin economy. So I mean, it's yeah, just gonna have to give it up at some point. Yeah, I mean, um, when this news came out and the FBI released their big press release announcing this, um, they kind of billed it as, like, this huge disruption to the dark net markets. And, like, there's nowhere to hide. You can't hide behind your computer. We're coming for you. And, they like, literally at the end of, at, at the, at the, at the end of one of their statements, um, the lady said, um, we don't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> like saying, okay, we're going to go after you forever and ever. <laughs> like, okay, um, okay, I see that you guys are really dedicated to taking down these markets. Um, but, like, at this at this point, like, it's obvious to everyone that they only got um, three major darknet markets out of, like, that exist. And including the top two, Agora and Evolution, which are still up and running, still fine, and they are probably going to start getting more business than ever, the old Silk Road users migrate to them. Um, It's like, okay, uh, good job. You got the low-hanging fruit um, (laughs) with, like, the worst uh, operation security imaginable, the guy who literally registered the server under his real name. Um, Okay, you got those ones. Uh, but there's still, you know, really good, high-quality, um, reliable markets that are running just fine, and you obviously couldn't do anything against them uh, because in your grand uh, Operation o- Onimus, Ominous. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, it's, it's really, it's entertaining to watch at the very least, try and watch them. You know, take themselves so seriously and take this whole operation so seriously, but in the end, um, it's only like a minor bump in the road for this this whole like growing community of people who are making consensual deals between themselves in a free market, um, totally safely through the internet, anonymous, with you know review systems um, that that makes sure that quality is, is highest. Um, and, and like life goes on as usual business as usual is going to continue on. There's just going to be, there's a short period right now where people are kind of spooked. Some are still wondering if, um, Agora is a honeypot. If somehow the feds still control it and they just haven't taken it down yet. Like they're still collect, collecting info on people, but like, uh, like give it a couple weeks and that, concern is going to fade away, and it's like, okay, we still have these great, it's going to keep doing the same thing as usual, and voila. I also remember 
Um, seen something a few days ago about California planning to release nonviolent drug offenders from prison. Is that a thing? Yeah, I voted for that actually. Yeah, that was one of the propositions that we had in California. Good for you for voting for that. Um, so yeah. you know, that's, that's just more evidence that the states are becoming increasingly uh, tolerant of drugs, and um, yeah. so you know, the DEA has a long history of uh, of hassling California for legalizing medical marijuana. And they've, they've been doing it in other states, too, recently. Um, so, you know, the more we progress towards acceptance of recreational drug use, just um, the more we're, people are going to start hating the, these federal law enforcement agencies because they're just um, completely disregarding, uh, you know, the will of, the, of their citizens because these states are nullifying the federal drug laws. Um, and the people, the people want that because a lot of times it's it happens to referendum, so the people vote for it directly. Um, yeah. So it it just proves that most of the federal government is entirely undemocratic, and that they don't really have the people's best interests in mind. And that's just that's really going to backfire on them at some point, because there just be hopefully. um because there just be so many people in the country who have decided that you know. Um, Liberty is much better than uh, centrally planning everything. Uh, but they're, you know, they're just gonna hate everyone in the federal government, and they'll just lose all legitimacy. Um, I know that they think that's not gonna happen, but I really believe that that's a serious threat that could happen within, you know, the next like 10, 15 years maybe. Um, and they're just totally unprepared for it, which I, you know, personally think is a good thing. But if you know they want to maintain their control for any amount of time they really have to you know get everything together and start reconsidering um, reconsidering how they're gonna like yeah. whether or not to abuse their power like they are right now yeah it's it's yeah the federal government is super out of touch and like people already are really starting to hate the federal government Congress is at 10 percent approval rating um, President Obama is at like 38% approval, um, but you know the people who approve of Obama, like they aren't necessarily approving of his policies or how he's handling the government itself, but like they they like him as a person, they like what he represents. You know, some people still associate Obama with hope and change and all that, so yeah. that's that makes up a and like the federal government already has lost just so much legitimacy because of all the crap that it's done in the past 10, 15, 20 years, and people just see this over and over, and, like, they can't hide what's happening from the people anymore because we have the Internet. Um, we have the Internet to just look up information at will, find out the truth of what's going on. It's all out there in the, in the open. People can find out about it. Um, but uh, g going back to the earlier points about um, medical marijuana in California and, like, and uh, you know, releasing nonviolent offenders from prison, um, like it's not just that people are like realizing the moral ish, you know, the morals relating to marijuana and like personal liberty. I can put in my body whatever I want, but also just like the practical logistics of locking up a huge amount of the population. It's expensive. Yeah, it's insane. Like, um, it like uh. I think it was the the actual the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, they actually had a case uh, relating to California. Um, like some prisoners or something sued the state of California over like the overcrowdedness of the prisons and how like just crowded and, and dirty it is and there's just horrible horrible living conditions. Like not only are these people like forced to live in cages and they have no liberty, but like they're forced to live in cages with like 20 other dudes, you know who. Are not clean and like the, the food is shit, like all, all this crap. And the court actually ruled that California has to reduce its prison population because there's just too many goddamn prisons. Yeah. Too many, too many prisoners and not enough prisons. So that's actually Pretty how that proposition was um, kind of born um, because the Californian government was actually like, okay, holy crap, we have this huge problem. We can't even ignore it anymore because. 
and the country is telling us that we can't ignore this problem. So that's why we have to figure out some way to reduce the prison population. And, um, you know, that's why they put this as a proposition towards the voters, be like, um, do you vote towards letting nonviolent offenders, um, particularly drug offenders, uh, get out of prison early? And people overwhelmingly approved it. Um, I think it was like 70% to 30%, somewhere around there, approved it. Um, I voted for it. Uh, pretty much um, everyone that I've asked actually <laughs> voted for it because um, even like older people realize that it's, it's completely ridiculous to be packing prisons with people who literally haven't hurt anyone besides themselves. Yep. And in those cases, it's much better to get those people rehabilitation instead of ruining their lives further putting them in a cage with you know, 20 other dudes who didn't do anything either. So it makes all the sense in the world to do that. Yeah, if only if only you guys would get together on the economic issues, California would be a pretty cool place. Yeah, that's, that's a totally that's a separate issue that is <laughs> huge other problems. You know, the, the proposition system is a double-edged sword um, because the, the, the downside of it is Anyone can propose a proposition, and once you get enough signatures, it gets on the ballot. So sometimes propositions get on the ballot where it promises like a brand new, like awesome social service, but it's not really paid for in terms of tax dollar allocation. Yeah. Um, they or if it is, like, yeah, you got you have to fund stuff. It's not free. So like they'll they'll, they'll like take out bonds, billions of dollars worth of bonds, um, and you know. People want instant gratification of services right now, but then once the bill comes later on, it's like, oh crap, we have a we have a budget uh, crisis in California. How did this happen? Where did this come from? And it's like, okay, crap. You know, that's the double-edged sword of the proposition system. People vote for stuff and don't want to fund it. Yeah, my county had a uh, a referendum on bonds for a public school system um, and I was just like you know all these campaign commercials for the uh, senatorial race talk about how uh, the Republican candidate has you know like slashed the education budget by so much uh, blah 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 it's like if our state government is you know cutting the education budget, um, the why, like, why are we simultaneously trying to go into debt to fund schools, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, every, like, the whole system is just messed up. Like, God, these government just can't do anything right. Yeah, I mean, well, like you've got you got problems on multiple fronts. Either it's government officials being corrupted themselves and making bad policy because of that, or in the case of California and other places, it's direct dem democracy where the people are trying to create policies themselves. Um, yeah, who they're spending you know, money before they have it. Yeah, they're they're kind of inherently corrupt in that way because they only have their self interests at heart and they they know nothing about economics um, or just really how to how any government policy works they want all the benefits without without any costs so that's it's, it's an issue and like the education thing like like we I, we had some uh, measures in my area as well for when you know funding electronics in schools you know giving them new computers and stuff like that but to pay for that you know the school district takes out bonds, um, which is basically debt. So, you know, the idea of, of funding education is to invest in the future, invest in uh, tomorrow's adults who are going to build tomorrow's economy. But then at the same time, if you're doing that by going into debt, then is that really a net positive? If you're going into debt now to hopefully, you know, make tomorrow's generation smarter 
and then you get into the, all the other issues of, oh, you know, who's going to oversee how this money is allocated? Is it really going to be spent on decent computers for these kids? Or is it going to be spent on just, you know, old, like, you know, four-year-old iPads that can't even run the latest apps? And then how are app, iPads going to help kids learn anyway? You know, you get into all these other problems as well. So it's like... It's, it's a tough situation. Yeah, I think we're just, our education is just going to go downhill until people would just start abandoning the public education system and looking for, and look for private alternatives. Because there's, obviously no way it's ever going to get fixed. Um, it's just so messed up, especially, um, especially in my state, the public education system. And, the Department of Education on the federal level has, you know, pumped up this huge student loan bubble that's going to pop, you know, soon. Yeah. Everybody's going to start defaulting on their debt. Department of Education is going to go bankrupt. Um, then there's going to be no credit available. And all the schools are going to shut down because nobody can afford to pay those high tuitions out of pocket. So there's definitely at some point has to be um, a big shift to alternative education methods, maybe self-education, um, I believe in that, Yeah, uh, but private education definitely. We're starting to see that shift happen slowly, and you only really notice it if you're really paying attention to what's happening on the internet. Um, places like Coursera and Khan Academy are putting up really, really good lessons online for people to educate themselves, um, and like you can learn really, really advanced material on on these websites. A lot of it is for free. In fact, more and more of it is, is for free every single year. They're putting, like this year, they started putting up lessons from Stanford. Like there was, uh, there's, there's a course going on that's from Stanford called How to Start a Startup. It's basically training a wannabe entrepreneurs and the steps needed to create a successful business off the ground. And, like, it's pretty legit. You have actual pro real professors from Stanford um, giving these lessons to people, and it's in a video, and it's uploaded to YouTube, and, you know, there's, a, you know, additional material that, he, that you can use to study to read along with the video, and it's, like, it's all free, and it's on the Internet. So, like, I think that's that's definitely the direction that education is going. Um you know, this whole thing of, of paying thousands of dollars in tuition to go to a physical campus, into a physical classroom with, like, 30 other people in the room with you and then have some guy at the front of the room, you know, pointing to his notes on a blackboard. Like, that's a super – that's becoming a really outdated form of education. And, like, I'm surprised that people aren't, you know, realizing this faster – that they can learn so much more online, but you know, I I guess some people really think that they that they need um, they need that official like certification from a physical yeah. institution to prove that they know the stuff. You know, it's like oh, if I learn stuff online, um, how am I going to be able to prove that I that I know that stuff? I need like a higher authority to put their stamp of approval on me to have it be legitimate. But, like, if you know the stuff, that's the proof enough, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Like, I've been teaching myself, studying economics independently for over a year now. And, um, you know, I kind of decided that, that might be something I want to do as a career or something in that field. And... Um, but, you know, nobody's going to respect me unless I have a degree, so, I, I mean, so I have to, like, go into a bunch of debt just to get a degree that I don't care about, I'm not going to use, just so I can do what I want. Just to get the yeah. approval from people. But that, yeah. I think that's going to start changing. You won't necessarily need the think, um, approval. I think, actually, at the primary and secondary schooling level, uh, I think homeschooling is really going to take off. Um, I think it's already making a comeback. Um, I know just one of one uh, particular program is called the Ron Paul 
homeschool curriculum or something like that. Obviously, it's libertarian oriented education. Um, whether or not you agree with that, it doesn't really matter. My point is, is that Better this than is. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but my point is, is that uh, it's super cheap. It's K through 12 education, and it's a hundred bucks a year. So, and it's homeschooled. It's focused on self-teaching. So there's, you know, after once you get to like sixth grade, there's like minimal parent involvement because it's focused on self-teaching. Hmm. Um, and it's a hundred bucks a year. So for 12 years, you know, it's 1,200 bucks. Um, yeah. And how Very much? Difficult. What is the average that government spends? Per child on education per year, it's something like twenty or thirty thousand dollars per year for each kid, and parents can do a homeschool curriculum, K through twelve, for less than one year's worth of college tuition, way less. So yeah. that's definitely going to become a viable alternative in the near future. Um, you know, I think libertarian education is great, but I hope it has to get you know. A lot more general than that for people to actually use it. Like, you're not going to get a socialist buying the Ron Paul curriculum, but hopefully it'll take off enough to just be general education, general curriculum, and that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, like um, I think most people, you know, when they hear, you know, about homeschooling education, maybe not most people, but there's a there's a general concern of like, oh, you're just teaching your kid your beliefs and your values and like it's associated closely with you know Christian homeschooling and um, you know global warming isn't real uh, the rapture is coming soon <laughs> like yeah. you know, don't don't believe in science evolution isn't real um, but like what you know if if you are homeschooling your kid and you do believe in those things if you're reasonably educated yourself and um, you you know uh, have a have a very good general understanding of you know scientific topics down to your kid. Um, you know, home homeschooling is going to become more and more legitimate as there's better methods available, and as the homeschoolers themselves, you know, the parents and the tools that they use, uh, become more intelligent and more advanced. So I definitely agree. Like that's I I think that um, if and when I have kids. Like I will seriously, seriously consider using homeschooling as an option for them, um, just because like I've seen how crappy the public school system is in my own experience, and in just cases that I hear from friends, family, and just strangers on the internet talking about public schooling, and it's like it's pretty crappy, and it seems to be getting crappier. Like it's kind of a broken system, and it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. So, like, homeschooling is a serious, serious valid option for the future. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, my high school experience was terrible. Um, and it really, it hurt me way more than it helped me because it seriously set me back in terms of, you know, how how seriously I took my education. Like, I went through four years of high school. I was completely miserable all four years. Um, I was completely uninterested in what I was learning. Um, and I just generally didn't didn't care. I went to college because I, you know, kind of had to. Um, I didn't start taking college seriously until my second year. So, you know, I, I seriously got a delayed a delayed start, but luckily, you know, I'm on track. I'm starting to graduate in four years, but I got a delayed start. I didn't do as well as um, I, w I would like to have done now looking back on it, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's because of the terrible experience I had in high school. It just made me um, this courage about education in general. Yeah, I didn't learn anything. In, I, I didn't learn anything in high school either. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, if if you're disinterested in the activities themselves in the, um, then you aren't really gonna retain that information later in your life. Like, you know, at at my high school, we were, we were required to take at least two years of a foreign language, so I took two years of Spanish, and I know like. A handful of Spanish words like I know maybe a dozen Spanish words um, or a little bit more and like I can maybe form some sentences but like <laughs> like the vast majority of stuff that I learned in Spanish class I just don't remember because I you know like the motivation is to just 
you know, to do the homework, take the material, just to graduate. You just want to, yeah. you just want to get a passing grade to be done with it. And it's like I just have to do this to to move forward in li my life. It's compulsory. Uh, we're forced to do this, so I'm just gonna get it over with. And like, there's no motivation to actually like soak in the material. That's the problem. Yeah, um, uh, the probably the biggest uh, way that public school harmed me was uh, I in high school I started struggling with math. Uh, it just got really hard for me for some reason uh, doing algebra and stuff. Mm. And um, you know they didn't really help me out any. I, f I failed uh, like at least half of the math classes I took in high school. And uh, but you know I. I never got held back a grade. Um, they kept, you know, they just passed me up to the next level. Uh, and then I was in college, I had to take college algebra, I had no idea what I was doing, just barely passed it. And now I'm really interested in economics. Um, obviously, I, I studied unorthodox school of economics, which doesn't use, you know, mathematical testing. So that's good for me, but if I want to do something with economics and, you know, in regards to my career, I have to get, you know, a mainstream degree from my school. That requires a lot of math. So I'm, you know, I have a serious knowledge deficit between what I'm capable of doing and, you know, what I want to do. It's it's uh, been really stressful on me, like, the past couple months. And yeah, just trying to keep up with the material that you're doing now based on the lack of information. Well, from I, haven't, I, haven't even gotten into the, I haven't even gotten into the math part yet. Um so I'm just really dreading it because I don't think, you know, I'm afraid I won't be able to do it and I won't be able to, you know, like pursue my dreams uh, because of how discouraged I got in high school and there was really no one there to help me. Yeah. Um, my my experience with math kind of kind of weird. Like um, I was actually, I was really, really good at math in elementary school and middle school. I was like two or three years ahead of, ahead of most people in my grade. Um, so I actually, uh, going into high school, I ended up taking pre-calculus slash trigonometry, kind of the same class. I took that in my sophomore year of high school because um, I was two years ahead of most people in my grade. And um, But I hit that point, and, like, it got really, really complicated, and it was really hard for me to get all these cosines and tangents and, you know, sine, <laughs> like all, all, all this stuff that I didn't even understand how it worked. I, I felt like I missed like the fundamentals of, of how trigonometry works somehow. But there, you can't really go back and, and look at that because like, there's just not enough time. Um, and you're so focused on the current material. And um, I failed. I failed pre-calculus in my sophomore year and um, ended up retaking it in my junior year because I pretty much had to to graduate high school. Um, even though I was advanced, I had to like pass a certain amount of years in math class and just barely passed in my junior year I got a C plus. After that, after I finally passed pre-calculus, I was like, I am not going any further in math. <laughs> Fuck this shit. Uh, it's not fun. I don't I don't get it. Um, my the teachers were horrible, so I was like like maybe I can go back to this at some point later in my life in my free time and, and like look up a trigonometry book. So I was like, I'm not gonna take this. And then going into college I was a journalism major because um, I, you know, just wanted to write. <laughs> so, like, I basically avoided all uh, math classes as much as I could in college. And, like, you had to take one or two math classes to graduate college, even with a journalism degree. But I didn't even really take math classes for that. I took a philosophy class that fulfilled the math requirements. What was it deductive logic? Something like that. Yeah, I um in my sophomore year I took deductive logic because it was um an equivalent to statistics and I needed statistics or an equivalent for my major. So I took the deductive logic class and I'm actually taking uh stats now this semester for uh my economic stuff. <laughs> and stats is way easier than that stupid philosophy class. Really? Yeah, I made I've got all that logic class with a C, um, and I'm making an A right now in statistics. Nice. Yeah, like, 
like with the philosophy class that I took, like it was basically you read a sentence and you figure out the various like logical elements yeah. of it. Yeah. And then you break them down into like, okay, this piece of the sentence is represented by this letter, and then plus this other part of the sentence is, is this letter, like leads to this outcome, and that's represented by like a different symbol or something. Yeah, you know? we learn we learn okay, like the yeah. laws. Sweet. We learn like the laws of logic, and then we had to do these crazy proofs, which were really hard for me because it was basically algebra, um, yeah. and I didn't know how to do algebra. So, mm. algebra was like the the last like type of math that I was decent at, you know, before I started getting up into trigonometry crap. Yeah, I remember in ninth grade, I actually made like an A or a B in ninth grade algebra. Um, but then, I don't know, I, in 10th grade we had to take geometry and I actually um, failed that. And uh, the, instead of just passing me along like they did for every other class, they actually made me dation. Or I had to stay after school and uh, like take a, take tests, take math tests, until I made an yep. 80 and so I made, got an 80 average, and the, um, the like overseer, the person who's like in charge of this computer lab, all the kids are in there, she she would watch me take the test, and she, like, she would make me take the test once, I would fail it, and then she would just give me the answers, and then I would take it again and pass it. Um, you know, so the remediation didn't really help me, because she was just giving me the answers, I didn't really learn anything, so. Yeah. Um, you want to get back on Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. I was just trying to figure out like a, a transition to that. Like I was going to ask you, oh, has your economics education uh, helped you understand like Bitcoin's fundamentals at all, or <laughs> is it like a totally different type of economics that they that they teach? Um, well, I mean, I got into economics because I started reading some like introductory libertarian philosophy, like Ron Paul's books and stuff. Um, and he started talking about the Fed, and I just got really interested in how the Fed worked. Uh, and so, and I, but I was like, I'm not going to understand this unless I understand all of economics. Mm. So I just started reading economics by myself, and um, and then I got into... And then I f like figured out what Bitcoin was, and I was like trying to apply w w the little bit of economics I knew at the time to it, um, and then I read a little bit more about monetary theory and realized you know, Bitcoin can actually be a thing economically, and then um, uh, then I actually noticed a big hole in monetary theory that doesn't adequately, adequately explain Bitcoin, so now I'm actually working on like an independent project of trying to fix that hole, so I mean I guess economics has helped me with Bitcoin a little bit. Um, yeah. But I would say that Bitcoin has helped me understand economics more than economics has helped me understand Bitcoin. Oh, interesting. So, like, <laughs> um, like the the main thing, is it's a limited supply of this thing that exists. Um, it's the amount that exists is governed by mathematics and governed by the algorithm that creates it. But uh, you know you can't, there's no central entity that can, you know, pump new uh, units of the currency into the economy. So it's just a certain amount that exists everywhere, and, you know, that's what people have to deal with. Like, there's no way to inflate the supply at all artificially to, like, try and, you know, create, you know, artificial demand, which is what uh, you know, the Federal Reserve basically does through quantitative easing and other types of inflation. Like, uh, you know, it's 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 like an entirely new concept we have in the technological age. Like, before, it was just precious metals, right, that were a limited supply of something that was valuable. Yeah. People placed value on it. Um, and people have used gold and silver as types of money in the past. But, you know, in today's age, this is a global economy. We're all interconnected with each other through the Internet. Um, but you can't transmit gold and silver across the Internet. 
uh, instantly <laughs> or even anyway. You can't you can't yeah. transport them. So now we have really to serve that purpose of a limited supply of this thing where you can get um, a tiny, tiny sliver of that limited supply and use it to transact between people for any kinds of any kind of transaction. And um, like that's that's the that's the huge crazy revolution that has happened with the advent of digital currency. Kind of something that, that economists never really predicted there was no way to predict this was going to happen 10 years ago and now that it is a thing and it's happening economists still don't know how to grapple with it they don't yeah. know how to deal with it and how to predict what's going to happen with it because it's just totally revolutionary it's you know totally new yeah the main economic problem with bitcoin though is where does its value come from um and as far as i know um I have to admit, I don't really know much about Keynesian or neoclassical uh, economics, not nearly as much as I do about Austrian economics, but as far as I know, is that um, is that they pretty much just use the Adam Smith uh, theory of money, which wasn't really a great theory, it just kind of said what money is and kind of left it at that. They didn't, um, and Adam Smith... Adam Smith's time was, you know, before subjective value, the marginal revolution, and all that. So the mainstream school doesn't really have anything to say on where Bitcoin's value originates, so they've just kind of ignored it. So it's mainly just the Austrian school that are really confused about where the value comes from because they have a very specific theory on the origin of money, and then they have um, a corollary of that theory that says how the purchasing power is determined. And... Um, and the person who you know discovered that theorem is called the regression theorem. Uh, made the conclusion from that theorem that money has to arise out of from a natural evolution where it was at one time a consumption good, a, a commodity, um, and people began using it for indirect exchange. That didn't happen with Bitcoin. Um, it was always a currency. Satoshi created it to be a currency. Um, the people who were testing its viability before it had value were testing it, its security and its usability as a currency. There's no direct consumption going on. Um, so that's a really big problem. It's, it has value, and this value is just... It's existing despite everything the Austrians have said about it. Um, and it, it's really frustrating a lot of people. It, it's led a lot some Austrians to like abandon Bitcoin entirely. They, they just say, well... They they just say well either Bitcoin's a bubble or, or Ludwig von Mises was wrong and they leave it at that. So, so yeah, there's a big there's a big hole in economics that's uh, some people are trying to close up. I'm working on something too, but I'm not gonna give it away because I don't want people to steal my idea. Yeah, but like I would expect the Austrians to be more um, open to the idea. Like I would expect um, Keynesians to be against Bitcoin because they can't inflate the supply to stimulate the economy artificially. But like, aren't Austrians all about, you know, limited supply of stuff and, and, you know, free markets and all that. And like, don't they see that that's how Bitcoin did gain its value. It started out as worth nothing, even though the system basically worked the same. It started out as worth nothing. Just computers generating these units uh, according to the protocol. But then eventually like Satoshi, was like, um, hey, Hal Finney, um, let me try sending you, like, whatever, 20,000 Bitcoins right now and see if it works. And you send them, send them 20,000 Bitcoins for free because they were worth nothing. Yep. And then Hal Finney's like, hey, um, you know, whoever his friend is, I'll send you 10,000 Bitcoins for, like, 25 cents because uh, we're doing this experiment and let's see if I can get money for it. And then it slowly just slowly goes from worth nothing to worth a fraction of a cent to worth one cent. And then eventually there's, you know, eventually more and more people who are willing to pay a slightly higher price for it. So isn't that like a natural, like economic, um, you know, phenomenon that happens that Austrians would kind of recognize as legitimate? Well, the problem is that they don't understand, um, 
how it's possible for something to have value as a medium of exchange without having prior use value as just a regular consumption good because um, because the standing economic theory says that it has to that it has to be um, a standard consumption good with direct use value before it can become valued as an object of indirect exchange so th their stance on it is that um, if our theories are right then this whole Bitcoin value thing is just a fluke and it's unsustainable so you know it's better to focus on you know some more realistic forms of money than on Bitcoin um, but the problem is that the standing theory um, that basically is they they just have a wrong understanding of what money is. Uh, they see it, they view it as purely a physical thing, um, but really money is actually a social institution. Um, uh, when people started using indirect exchange, they developed this. Uh, uh, well, they basically gain knowledge that indirect exchange is better than barter, um, so they continue to use indirect exchange, and they just developed this social network based around indirect exchange, um, where yeah. people... I'm basically giving away my entire theory right now, which I said I wasn't going to do, but... Um, where people... So people just expect their neighbors to use this object of indirect exchange, whatever it is, uh, whatever it was when money first happened. Um... So really, really, when you think about money, when you think about Bitcoin versus gold versus fiat, um, there's two really two distinct things you have to examine. There's, um, you know, there's the non-physical social aspect of it, um, which is what I call money, uh, money, the social institution, um, and then there's currency, which is the physical manifestation of the social institution. So. Um, what I'm saying is that once people, uh, you know, employ their entrepreneurial ingenuity and, and discover that indirect exchange is better than barter, um, and they develop this uh, this knowledge that will never die, and it, it forms into this uh, social network and a social institution of indirect exchange. Um, once that institution is established. Um, then money is a good like any other good. Standing economic theory says that, um, you know, so there's no reason why an entrepreneur can't create a currency as a currency, nothing more than a currency, um, and market it based on its, you know, gimmicks or features as a currency. So uh, applying that to Bitcoin, Satoshi created something that is completely transparent, completely decentralized. Um, it's scarce, it's mathematically scarce, um, and it's long-term inevitably deflationary. Everything libertarians love. It's a libertarian wet dream, basically. Um, so that's how it was able to get value, because um, it, it, it was just sold, basically, like you would sell, you know, a chicken leg at the grocery store based on the way it was cooked, the way it tastes, the way it looks. Bitcoin was sold based on its pseudonymity, its scarcity, uh, its decentralization, um, and people paid money for it. They paid existing money for it, and that's how it became hooked to fiat. Um, and then the rest, you know, the rest is history. We we know what happened after that. So that's my yeah, take on it. Still seeing it happening. Um, that's that's my take on the, the theory behind Bitcoin. Um, you know where where I think the theory has to be revised is the uh, is they focus too much on the physical manifestation of a social institution, um, and they don't see things. They don't see what's going on uh, a little bit deeper. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it seems like um, like a serious barrier to pe some people's understanding of Bitcoin is the fact that they have trouble seeing uh, value in something that is not physical. 
uh, you know, just something that is digital that uh, is only accessible through the internet at this time. Um, like they can't see how that has value or how other people see that has value because it's it's not you know this this goes back to the Cassatius uh, coins that are constantly shown in pictures on news articles physical bitcoins that's like the only way for people to like visualize these things yeah. is in physical coins because they just it's it's hard for them to grasp the idea of a purely digital asset that actually has value. It's like, um, I don't know, like, I guess these people don't have a good enough ex understanding of the internet itself, um, or maybe they just, they're, they're too skeptical and they think that the fact that it's digital means that someone can duplicate it easily, the same way you can copy a file on your computer. But then, you know, it shows they have no, uh, no real understanding of how it cryptographically ensures that they can't be duplicated. So um, it's like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mental block that um, it's, it's gonna take a lot of time for those types of people to come around, or at least for those types of people just to just become irrelevant in the long run as the rest of us continue onward in, in this digital economy where we do recognize that this thing has value. We do recognize that this is worth um, acquiring and holding on to and, and using and tipping, um, like, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities uh, through the internet that were never possible before. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, it. Um, your paper is probably going to do a lot of good to, like, try and, um, you know, give a new, a new economic perspective relating to Bitcoin. But ultimately, like, the people who need convincing of the economic properties um, like they're going to be irrelevant in the long run. I think like the rest of us who are totally open to this idea, um, are just, you know, full steam ahead, keep building, you know, crazy applications for Bitcoin, uh, keep building marketplaces for it. Uh, like there's so much untapped potential and it's like, um, I guess, I guess those types of people will, will start to see, um, the possibilities more as we start building more and more, you know, um, tangible, uh, uh, you know, projects relating to Bitcoin. And once they see that, oh, there's a there's a marketplace that exists on the internet where people can trade between each other in a decentralized manner uh, without trusting a person in between. Um, you know, eventually we're gonna bizarre on our cell phones, on our smartphones, you know, yep. and really trade with people across the world using Bitcoin um, with, without having to trust anyone in between. You don't have to trust a, a monetary institution. You don't have to trust a, a website or any centralized servers or anything. Um, that that's, that's a huge, huge implication that has never existed before. And like economists will have to, will have to, recognize the power of that, at least to some degree, once things like that start um, start coming to fruition. It's definitely going, at some point, it's going to have to, uh, economists are going to have to seriously rethink their theories, especially the mainstream economists, um, because, well, I mean, they're just wrong about everything, so... Um, yeah. But, even about the regular economy, they're wrong yeah, about Yeah, yeah, they, so. they can't even figure out they can't even figure out how they created the mess that we're in right now but that simultaneously they're trying to fix it it's, it's just mind blowing to me um, that they're just so wrong about everything but they think they're geniuses because they have degrees going back to the education thing um, but yeah if you you know if you really if you really think about the evolution of money um, it, it almost seems inevitable that Bitcoin that something like Bitcoin would happen because um if you just look at the history of money, um, you know, in pre-industrial societies, uh, we see examples of this in like some areas of modern-day Africa and some, you know, severely underdeveloped countries. Uh, the currency is actually, you know, pigs and cows, um, and it's and it's because their entire existence, uh, their entire economy is agrarian. Uh, they farm everything, so the most valuable things in their society are livestock, and that's what they trade. Um, but then as you become more industrial, 
you start, you know, using more metals and things, well, you know, the rarest, the most durable metals are going to become the most valuable, gold and silver. Um, and so we can see, like, the currencies, the physical manifestations of money that people use uh, to conduct indirect exchange, they've, um, historically they've changed as economies have developed. Um, and the... Uh, the currency is at least has usually at least been somewhat related to the main source of wealth for a society. So as we go into the digital age, uh, more and more of the economy is being conducted online digitally. So if we look at that historical progression and just assume that there's you know some underlying force there that it, that it's it actually makes sense that. Uh, currency reflects the state of the economy, uh, then it makes total sense that money would be digital. Um, yeah. You know, it, it That's already... a really good point that I haven't heard before. Like the, the, the currency of a particular economy is like based on how that economy builds its wealth. Yeah, and if you, if, you really th if you really think about the economic theory of the origin of money, um, that, like that's how, that's how I came to the realization uh, because... Uh, society started out very isolated. It started out with small groups, uh, you know, families, um, and then, and the very, the very, very first money that that one physical object that sparks the social institution of money, it has to come, it has to come from the iso not isolated, but it has to come from the very small scale economy. Uh, and so it has to be a good that's objectively valued by everyone in that society, or else they they wouldn't be able to use it to trade it for anything. So if you know if you really think about it like that, and you think about how small and specialized the uh, economies of like pre-industrial societies were, um, then you kind of come to the realization that uh, the origins of money. Uh, the, the very first currencies would have to reflect the societies that they came from um, because the things that they valued were very narrow in scale uh, because uh, their economies were severely underdeveloped. There's basically just, uh, you know, basic subsistence. So it would be like if you were um, a farmer, you know, you might, grains of corn, kernels of corn might be your currency. If you're a fisherman, yeah. um, if you're a fisherman, like hooks might be a currency, and that just progresses uh, and expands and evolves as the economy becomes more interconnected and larger. And um, it just makes perfect sense that as the economy becomes digital, currency becomes digital. Yeah, actually, the corn thing you mentioned actually reminded me of something that I <laughs> coincidentally learned back in school, elementary school. Like uh, we would talk about the Native Americans and and their culture and stuff. And I think I recall that they actually uh, used you know kernels of corn. As, as currency between each other because, uh, you know, it's something yep. that a lot of them had. It was it was based on, you know, value in their economy, and um, it was also relatively small and easy to trade between people. So. Yep. And actually, um, in colonial America, uh, when the Europeans came over and, uh, you know, the frontier, like the West, like, you know, Tennessee was considered the West, um, the the hunters the the Native Americans who were hunters those tribes they they would um they would trade with the white people and uh, in that like frontier area animal skins actually became somewhat of a currency uh, mm -hmm. you know the um the like the animals that were harder to kill their skins became you know more valuable uh, depending on like the type of you know, the type of meat that was wanted or whatever, or the, you know, like, what, whatever, you know, white ladies, whichever fur was in fashion, that one become the most valuable. And, you know, the Native Americans would trade amongst themselves, but then the frontiersmen who lived among, who lived alongside them would trade animal skins as well. Coastal tribes used rare seashells. Um, some European societies a really long time ago used, like, bags of salt. Um, yeah, that salt used to be really, really valuable. Yeah, so it, you know, money is really, it's just a reflection of the state of the economy, if you think about it, if you look at the history of money. So, I mean, it makes sense to me that it would become digital. 
Yeah, and like you know, once we once we get you know 99% of society having smartphones or some sort of digital device, it doesn't have to be a full blown smartphone, but just something that is able to transact in Bitcoin with other people. You know, have it be able to scan QR codes and be able to connect to some sort of internet network to broadcast a transaction. Um, you know, once everyone has a device like that, uh, you know, literally anyone can transact in Bitcoin anywhere in the world. Um, and that, you know, that type of future is very, very close. That's what, um, that's what Coinapult is working on, right? They, they've developed an app, uh, where you can, uh, transact Bitcoin through SMS, right? That, that's Coinapult, right? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, it doesn't even have to be a smartphone. Um, and I've brought this up several times. I saw this thing on Reddit one time. This guy did a proof of concept. Uh, he was able to broadcast the uh, blockchain on AM radio waves. Um, you know, people people who are, like, new to Bitcoin think it's this super high-tech thing. And one of the criticisms I see every once in a while is, like, oh, what if the, you know, what if the power grid goes down? What if, uh, what if smartphones or how is it going to reach the people, like, Poor people in Africa. Get people get blasts from the from the sun or something. Yeah, like, well, I mean, Bitcoin is actually, you know, it's very low tech. I mean, it's capable of being low tech. It can be yeah. used on very low tech systems like AM radio. You know, nobody's used AM radio like since the 50s. Um, but now we we broad we can broadcast the blockchain on it. Um, yeah, the tricky yeah. part would just be finding a way to to um, broadcast a transaction as well on the network. Because AM yeah. radio, you can receive the signal, but I, I mean, I guess I guess you could, you know, send out an AM signal. As, there's probably a way to do that. Yeah, I'm not really sure how, like, the, it wasn't really, like, a very polished project. The guy just wanted to see if he could do it. Um, and he's like, yeah, you know, I managed to do it like this one time, so, you know, proof of concept. But, you know, it's possible. It's possible for Bitcoin to operate on very low-tech things. Uh, so you don't need the latest smartphone. You don't, you know, you don't need the iPhone 6 Plus with a, you know, 12-foot-long screen to use Bitcoin. Yeah. Although it's nice. It's nice to have. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy to think about, though. You know, we have these smartphones now with all yeah, these apps really... that can do all this stuff. And they're only six years old. People forget that too. Like they're only six years old. And um, yeah, smartphone yeah. today, you know, the uh, Galaxy S5 is just light years ahead of the this first iPhone in 2008. Yeah, man, that first iPhone came out in 2008, and we're already this this far. You know, they're super fast and powerful, and like there's, you know, when the first iPhone came out, the apps were restricted. They didn't let you. Um, create your own apps or download any apps other than what came with the phone, and then eventually started people making them. People started making their own apps anyway, and releasing it on the the you know the underground you know app store, and eventually you know just exploded. And, and now we have apps that do everything that you can that you can think of, including managing your money on the blockchain. So you know, yep, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it all happened in you know in six years. Yeah. Whereas, and, and imagine ten years from now, where are we gonna be? What What are these devices I mean, I gonna be? I can't imagine it. You know, like I'm I'm not even smart enough to envision something like that. Yeah, it's like you know, it's 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 up to us basically, us and other people in our generation. New products of the future, the new services of the future. Try and like imagine something that no one's ever thought of before. You know, we. We have ways that we can manage money in our own pockets now. That's never happened before. Um, you know, you, sure, sure. You could, you know, a few years ago even, you could you could have a PayPal account and have money in your PayPal account. But that's just a that's just a particular ledger on that one company's spreadsheet on their server somewhere, and they give this service to you. But now your money is actually on your device. Your private keys to the Bitcoin blockchain. Or on your device, and you can do anything with it. And you know, now, like even a year ago, we didn't have uh, very many reliable uh, mobile wallets for smartphones. 
and now we do. So the next step is, okay, uh, you know, now we can hold and manage our money and send it and then do all this stuff and pay for things with it. But what's the next step after that? Who, you know, who is going to make the app um, where you can manage your Bitcoin stocks all, all in an app? You know, when's, you know, counterparty, counterparty is starting to create the stock system for Bitcoin. Um, you know, eventually that's going to be in an app on your smartphone where you can just pull up an app and your, your Bitcoin's already loaded on there and just be like, okay, I want to, I want to invest in Overstock. <laughs> I want to invest in Overstock and just do, 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 a couple taps and boom, you invest in Overstock. Like no need to go through freaking this E-Trade service where they take a, you know, a cut of your earnings yeah. commission fee and you know and it won't even necessarily be um, uh, regulated by the government so they won't necessarily be able to uh, take capital gains taxes oh yeah um, especially if it's decentralized if the app is decentralized yeah yeah and you know that all, that that kind of area also depends that they try and set up during the next couple of years and there's a lot of people pushing for um, you know, government involvement in digital currency transactions, and we've we've talked so much about that, and you know, it's still in progress. And there's a lot of advocates that are saying, let's get the government's um, eyeballs in this, and you know, get, get their noses up in it, so they can make sure that no one's profiting too much off it without paying their fair share of taxes. That's just not going to happen. The, yeah. hard, the harder they push, the more underground Bitcoin users go. Um, and, the, you know, they develop bigger and better apps that make it more anonymous. Um, you know, with, I, th I think with, you know, Dark Wallet, you, you pr you'll pretty much just be able to, you know, buy drugs out in the open and they won't be able to catch you. You know? Yeah. Well, like, it'll, it'll um, you know... I was actually explaining this to my to my family in, in the car earlier today. Like we were we talked about we started talking oh, about. Oh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they love you. I was talking about <laughs> Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, not always. I'm trying to taper it down, but you know, we actually um, started talking about the Silk Road thing, and, and I mentioned you know um, Dark Wallet and uh, and how it you know mixes up transactions, make them make them anonymous, and Bitcoin is totally the transactions are public by default, but people are making these tools now to totally um, obfuscate uh, transactions and make it so that you can't see where payments are coming from and all this. and um, It's just amazing. It's just amazing to see all this being built. And yeah. But, you know, something about Dark Wallet that I just learned, I don't know I don't know how I let this get by me, but I was under the impression that it was going to be like, um, like a dedicated desktop application, but it's a Chrome and Firefox extension. Uh, mm -hmm. That that just seems I don't know that, that that doesn't seem very like that doesn't seem as safe to me as having like a desktop application. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, app that they chose to take. I'm sure that they could make a desktop app if they wanted to. They could probably make a mobile app if they wanted to as well. It'd probably just be more difficult. And I'm I bet that's coming down the line at some point. But um, having it as a Chrome app is um, relatively secure. Um, like, as long as, you know, you have a password for it um, and you, you know, don't get infected by a virus. Don't um, use your real email address, obviously. Yeah, you know, that actually, that's, that's a good point. Like, you know, if people yeah, are signed up. If you Google. log into Chrome with your Gmail account and you download uh, or you install the Dark Wallet extension, you know, then then your wallet is connected to your to your email and yeah, you're yeah. not anonymous anymore. Yeah, yeah. I guess you know, it, it wouldn't mean that your transactions are attached to your name. Um, it would just mean that uh, people would be able to see that you downloaded Dark Wallet and installed it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can watch your transactions or anything like that. Um, but yeah, like I, I certainly, I hope that they come out with like a, a mobile app. But I guess, you know, even in, even with a mobile app, like if you download it on the Google Play Store, like 
if people still, you know, still yeah. attach to your Google account if you download it from the Google Play Store. So yeah, well, I mean, the great thing about Android is that uh, you don't have to download from the App Store. You can download the um, APK directly. That's true. Google. You can download it. So yeah, um, I've done that a lot of times because I like to pirate paid apps sometimes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, before we close this out, I guess let's talk about um, a couple other stories that happened this week. Um, so apparently someone set up a gigantic mining farm in Thailand uh, worth $3.6 million. Um, and like the hash rate jumped and then actually took a dive when the mining farm went up in flames, literally. Um, it was a proof of burn. Uh, credit to you, to Reddit commenter. Um, the whole place went up in flames. $3.6 million worth of Bitcoin mining equipment um, burned and destroyed. So, yeah, like, I mean, first of all, that's really unfortunate. It's too bad that, I guess, or something, something went wrong um, to destroy that. But, like, holy crap, there are people who are dropping over $3 million onto a single Bitcoin mining farm. Like, that's just that's just mind-blowing yeah, to me. In itself. Like, I mean, we I think we've talked before about mining farms that we knew about in China. Um, and the coinsman.com did a like an investigative story. They actually went into one of these mining farms, took pictures and stuff. But like, it's nuts. It, like this is the reason the hash rate is still rising exponentially, and it's the reason why if you have a thousand dollars to plop down on Bitcoin mining and you think you're going to turn a profit, um, think again, <laughs> because even a thousand dollar mining equipment probably not going to turn a profit because the, 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 the difficulty is always retargeting in Bitcoin based on how many miners are on the network. And as more and more people get into it with these, you know, gigantic mining farms, um, that the difficulty keeps rising and, and there's only a certain amount of Bitcoins that get created every hour, every day. So there's only a certain amount to go around and the people with the most computer power mining it, um, get the majority of those. So, um, like, holy cow! Like, I mean, where are we where are we gonna be like in in a year? In a year, are we gonna start seeing, you know, billion dollar mining farms popping up? Um, Wouldn't surprise me. Trend is going. Yep, and they let it catch on fire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I saw some people on Reddit speculating that. Uh, that fire may have actually been responsible for a dip in hashing power or the hashing rate that happened. Uh, apparently, I, I didn't know it happened because I don't pay attention to mining stats or anything. But, so yeah, so that's, that's interesting. But, I mean, Jesus, like, $3 million to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Um, and, you know, I'm, just, I'm sure that... I'm sure that's not the biggest one either. I mean, I'm sure there's bigger ones like in China. Yeah. Or maybe uh, uh, Iceland, where it's really cold. So um, that'd be a good idea. Find a cold country where there's cheap electricity, and that's the best place to set up a mining farm. Yeah. Well, I've seen I've seen people speculate that um, as as mining becomes uh, more and more expensive and uh, bigger of an industry, it'll. Uh, people are predicting that it, um, that most of the mining will take place in Iceland because it's so uh, so cold that it's um, that it's uh, cheaper to uh, cool their machines because they don't have to. Um, obviously, because the air is colder, they don't have to work as hard to keep them cool, uh, which also would yeah. cut down on the electricity consumption. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They don't have to, you know, route power into fans as much. So. Yeah, but if you're going that route, why not just go to Antarctica? 
That's what I would do. Yeah, take, go to the extreme. Yeah. Yeah. But then, how do you get electricity, enough electricity yeah, in, in our dark, in our dark? Solar power? Someone should get on that. <laughs> I mean, so, the hydroelectricity, you're in the middle of an ocean. Yeah, and then with, with the excess heat that that mining farm does produce, you just live there. Live there yeah. in Antarctica um, with your heating source being the Bitcoin blockchain. <laughs> and just just order all your stuff online with Bitcoin, with your Bitcoin that you mined. And, um, you know, have someone deliver to your little South Pole, uh, you know, operation. You can be the Santa Claus of the South you know, Pole. You know, there are people who still run their... Uh, they're obsolete mining rigs um, as heaters because uh, the electricity used to run the rig is like cheaper than their heat bill. Really? Yeah, That's... I see people. Some people uh, talk about that on Reddit, and, like post pictures and stuff. That's pretty cool. Pretty funny. So then, yeah. I guess they don't really. They don't... Yeah, yeah. They don't mind, um, you know wasting some money on electricity on this mining rig. Yeah. It's almost like they were going to spend the electricity anyway on heating. So. Yep, and you know, at the same time, they're contributing to the network, confirming, helping confirm transactions and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, and probably making at least a little bit of Bitcoin uh, in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, crazy state of mining. Getting into some crazy days of mining. So um, let's... Let's close out on a little bit of uplifting news, slightly uplifting. Um, uh, BitPay released a new Bitcoin checkout app um, this week, and they have activated NFC technology into this app uh, for merchants. So, you know, there was a lot of hype a couple weeks ago about Apple Pay and how Apple Pay <laughs> enables NFC payments wireless, you know, one-touch payments with phones, no need to scan a QR code. And, um, you know, this is, we knew this was possible with Bitcoin. If it's possible with a regular smartphone app, then you can do it with Bitcoin payments as well. And, you know, BitPay, major payment processor for Bitcoin, um, they actually release a lot of uh, really nice um, Bitcoin apps and features, including Copay, multi-sig wallet recently as well. And um, they've brought NFC to Bitcoin now as well. So, um, you know, we, we still have to wait and see if a lot of merchants are going to integrate this. Um, not only does the merchant have to be open to Bitcoin, but they've got to have, you know, uh, the tablet with the app installed and, you know. Right. And uh, uh, NFC, uh, Google Wallet was kind of a flop because, you know, there weren't that many point of sale uh, places that had NFC capability, so that you know that would have to change. But yeah, yeah, and there's still a lot of cool. places that are anti NFC. Um, you know, just looking at you know Walmart and CVS Pharmacy and places like that have, that have banded together to create their own payment app called yeah. Current C, which is a total piece of crap, and we don't need to get into that right now. But just search up Current C on the internet, and you can read about all the crap about that. Um, but like, uh, yeah, I guess this, it's, this is a proof of concept basically that this is possible, um, uh, to, you know, I don't mind dealing with QR codes that much. It's, it's actually kind of fun, uh, scanning QR codes, especially. Yeah, it's uh, really easy too. Yeah. Like, especially like on the internet, if someone can post their QR code, like on a video or something and you can, if you like their video, you can just scan it with your phone afterwards. But uh, you know, I guess this is a this could be a big development for in-store merchants, person-to-person, person-to-cashier -person, uh, person payments um, with Bitcoin. So um, pretty pretty cool proof of conference uh, proof of concept. Uh, thank you, BitPay, for making another cool, awesome thing and contributing back to the ecosystem. So mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to mention change tip because that was like the biggest piece of news, the hugest thing this week. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So apparently over the course of the week, uh, change tip just went viral on Reddit and uh, some other places on the internet. Um, 
I saw some some like general estimates that the like whole viral explosion of change tip uh, has brought aware Bitcoin awareness to like approximately 6,000 people, which is pretty crazy. Um, and basically what happened is that people just started like and tipping, they started tipping uh, people on Reddit, uh, some other places, I guess, like small amounts of Bitcoin, but they did it. Uh, that, like there was just such a huge increase in volume, like uh, tipping was going on everywhere. It's still going on. Um, and change tip actually had to like, temporarily limit their uh, the amount of transaction volume that they would process because the like reddit was crashing the tipping bot it, you know it was crazy um, so yeah it was actually it was I think it was a problem with reddit specifically like not change tip but like the bot that they used to verify that a, that a tip went through this tip has been collected by blah blah blah, blah, blah. Like it was, the bot was just making so many, so many comments that day that um, it was just too much. Reddit, Reddit couldn't handle it. Too much tipping. Yeah, and it's it's really cool because there's several. Uh, I've seen several threads on on the Bitcoin subreddit where people uh, they say, "Hey, I I just got tipped Bitcoin. What is it, and how do I use it?" Mm. So you know, it definitely it definitely worked. It spread awareness to a lot of people, and some people seem to be interested in it. It was, it was really cool, and the you know Bitcoin subreddit was just going crazy about it this week. Yeah, yeah, you know, change tip is amazing. Like I I'm still trying to get into the habit of tipping a lot, like myself. You know, um, you know, on Reddit, like the whole thing is you give upvotes to posts that you like that you think are contributing in a really good way that you like what they're doing um, or if you really really love what they're doing then you give them reddit gold yeah but you know um, change tip is this totally new thing where um, you know I don't even I don't even really know how reddit gold works I don't know like do you have to fund your um, your account beforehand before you buy the reddit gold is it a set is it a set price for the gold like five or ten bucks and if you only have a dollar then you can't give someone reddit gold like, I don't know how that works but even if you um, only have like a dollar you can send change tip yeah reddit gold I think it's it's like on a monthly thing it's like three dollars a month um, and you can buy it for yourself or you can buy it as a gift and like if you click give it as a gift you could type in the person's username um, and you can actually pay for that with Bitcoin too which is cool but mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's kind of like, uh, like top tier comments. But you know, if somebody says something funny, you give them like you know twenty five cents worth of Bitcoin or something. I've never used Change Tip because I'm greedy and I don't want to part with any amount of my Bitcoin at all, unless it's to benefit me. So, but I'm glad there, that there are people out there who are a little more altruistic than me. Yeah, yeah, and then like the the crazy thing is we might be in a Bitcoin low right now. So we're at $345 for, per coin right now. And if you tip someone a dollar on change tip and the price doubles in the next month, and suddenly yeah. that person has $2. It's like, oh man, I gave that person $2 instead of a dollar. But like, that's also part of the fun too. Like someone can receive a dollar or, you know, receive $5 in tips. And all of a sudden, a couple months from now, it's like, oh wow, that doubled to, Ten dollars, and I can can buy a movie yeah. ticket with that, or something. Can, you know, they can watch it grow and just, you know, just by extension of being interested in watching it grow, they learn a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, kind of learn about the decentralized aspect, how the how the blockchain works, and all that. Or if they don't even want to learn, and they're just like, okay, this is something that has value, this random Bitcoin thing that. You know, maybe it's a Ponzi scheme. I don't really get how the blockchain works or anything like that. You know, um, I don't get the economics behind it or any of the technology. But I can send it to this place called Gift.com in exchange for yeah. legitimate gift gift cards, um, and go shopping on Amazon with this money that someone gave me on Reddit or Twitter or YouTube or Google Plus. Uh, Facebook is supposedly coming down the pipeline. Once you can tip people Bitcoin on Facebook, that'll be a game changer. I'll be tipping all the freaking time. 
spreading spreading Bitcoin to Facebook network, whether they like it or not. And the, and another cool thing about Change Tip is that I want to mention is um, you can tip to all kinds of people that have never heard about Bitcoin, and if they don't want to or know how to collect it, and they're just like they don't they never make a Change Tip oh, wallet, you get it back. It, you get you get it back, and um, you know that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome. It's like not really risking your money. Unless the person is really serious about uh, receiving it, so that's pretty awesome to have that feature. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, it'll make social media more fun. It'll make Reddit more fun. Um, in particular, that's one of the things I've always liked about the Dogecoin community is that they're just so they tip uh, just so crazy. That, like if you go on the Dogecoin subreddit, like on like any thread, they're just like there's more there's more tips than there are comments and it's just hilarious I, I just like looking at it sometimes um, but I kind of take it in doses in small doses because the entire subreddit is in comic sans but that's why I can't stand that subreddit yeah yeah it gets, really, it gets really annoying after like 10 seconds and um, but I mean Bitcoin is more valuable so uh, people will be more interested in it so it'd be it would it'll definitely make reddit um, a lot more fun. Yeah, you know, I've got I've got like eight bucks or so in my change tip account right now. You know, one of these days when I'm just really bored or something, got nothing else to do, I'm just gonna go on and, you know, just send out like ten or twenty tips of like you know twenty five cents here or there, twenty five to fifty cents, and just crazy. Yeah, um... Yeah, there there's this guy on Twitter. His name is Ken, who's been like uh, tipping us regularly for the podcast. And you're awesome, yeah. by the way, Ken. Um, yeah, thank you, Ken. Yeah, yeah every every, every time he tips me with change tip, um, I just put it straight into my wallet. I, like I don't care how. <laughs> right, that I changed it. Yeah, I don't I don't <laughs> care how insignificant of of an amount it is. I I, I put it straight into my Armory wallet and add it to, add it to my balance. Nice, nice. Well, you know, like what one of the other things about Change Tip is like it's Change Tip itself is not a decentralized entity. Um, they're they're centralized. They've got um, this stuff on central servers, and like theoretically, um, Change Tip could disappear and pull a Mount Gox at some point. Like I don't, you know, I don't want to jinx it or anything, but like. Um, good idea that if you aren't going to send that money back out and tip it forward then it is a good idea to pull it out into your own wallet because you don't know if that service is going to be there in a week even though they do they do seem really legitimate they seem dedicated the support is great um, but you know we don't we don't have a decentralized uh, tipping method yet uh, change tip is still a centralized service right now so like you know if you ain't gonna tip it forward, might as well withdraw it, right? Don't don't yeah. risk losing that two dollars uh, to a to another change tip implosion. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that. I I just always send it to my my uh, desktop wallet because I'm greedy. I'm not giving my Bitcoin to anybody <laughs> unless they're selling me something. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm like I'm not saying I'm gonna tip forward my whole eight dollars, but at least a <laughs> portion of it. It it. it posts that I see really like you know the other uh, last week or something there was someone who um, I'm a fan of Dragon Ball Z and someone drew a picture of uh, Goku from Dragon Ball Z but a realistic like humanized picture and um, I thought that was pretty funny he looked pretty funny and I was like you know someone actually took the time to use their art skills to draw this fan picture of a cartoon character that I'm familiar with and give it a a new um, take, and then they also went, took the extra step of posting it to Reddit so that a whole new audience, including myself, could see. And it's like, you know what? I want to reward that with 25 cents right now. Boom! Change tip. Have some Bitcoin. There you go. Yeah, I almost bought somebody gold one time with Bitcoin uh, because it was the person's cake day, and he said something really funny. Um, but. You know, then I thought about it. And I was like, God, this is three dollars that I could, you know, save towards something yeah. else. Yeah. And, and that's, but um, but yeah, that's just not. Uh, 
It's just, that's not just Bitcoin in general for me. That's how I'm with all money. I, I hate spending money for some reason. I don't know why. It's like painful just to buy anything. And mm -hmm. like I don't get I don't get how people um uh you know unless unless you have to obviously if you're like supporting a family or something you don't really have a choice. But people who are like my age they don't really have any bills or financial obligations, but they're living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I don't I don't get. Uh, what enjoyment you get out of that, and it's totally not necessary. Um, it's, it's consumer culture, basically. But, Consumerism. Or, or maybe, or maybe I'm just like a greedy miser who likes to, you know, swim in money, like Scrooge McDuck or whatever. Um, uh, but I don't just, I don't You're get why people. Asshole, I, I don't, I don't get why people just buy stuff like constantly, and they don't save anything like I don't know I'm just I'm just always thinking about you know like I could buy this really dumb thing that I will probably forget completely about in a year or I could save this in case I'm, I'm starving to death you know at yeah. some point in the future yeah. like that's how I think about money and so I end up never spending any of it so that's why I don't tip people on reddit <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I guess on that note, we can kind of wind this down. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess, damn, that, yeah. Um, interesting news this week. Uh, thanks to you guys for listening uh, to the Coin Brief podcast. This has been episode number 22. I'm Sean, this is Evan, and um, we're your hosts <laughs> week to week. And um, hopefully, you know, hopefully this podcast has gone pretty well. This is our, this is our, not the first time we've done Google Plus, but the first time we've done Google Plus Hangout um, in a really long time, maybe for, since the first or second episode, actually. Yep. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed. It's been a good watching experience, good listening experience. Um, so yeah, um, please like us, follow us, um, subscribe on YouTube and all that, and um, catch us next week with some more news in Bitcoin. Thank you guys. See you later.